The scientific revolution starts now. I started out as a computer scientist, as an information theorist uh, in particular. And very early on, I was also interested in the question of uh, information theory and quantum mechanics, much before it became fashionable in the 1980s with Feynman and so on. And then in the 80s, I was also working on machine translation and this uh, uh, perplexing piece of information that we have in history that 2,500 years ago, a grammar of Sanskrit was constructed uh, with uh, 3,000 uh, algebraic rules, which is totally out of, uh, out of uh, context in a certain sense, because history books told us that India 500 BCE did not have writing. So I found this very, very incongruous. Uh, so what I did was from that point on, late 80s, I started out uh, investigating different layers of Sanskrit literature for science. I started out with writing. And of course, uh, there is writing in India, which goes back to about 3000 BCE. But the standard view of uh, Indian lexi lexicography is that the later historical scripts are not associated with it. There is a break in Indian history. So I started out studying that. And then um, obviously the question of astronomy came up because the ancient man all over the world, you know, slept under open skies, at least during the summers when it wasn't cold and saw the cavalcade of stars going from one direction to the other, from east to west and so on. So I wondered, you know, what was the Indian take on astronomy? And, and uh, that's what got me started. And uh, I looked at the uh, earliest Indian um, uh, ritual. And the Indian ritual was a representation of the cosmos and the motions of the sun and the moon. So I was working on that in the late 80s, early 90s. And then um, 1992, I think it was November, I was reading the New Yorker magazine. And the last page had an essay by John Updike. Um, that uh, started off saying that, isn't it amazing that the size of the sun and the moon, looking at it from the earth is about the same. And the moment I read it, something uh, extraordinary happened to me. And I knew it had something to do with the very organization of the Rig Veda. So I rushed to my library, pulled down my Rig Veda, which is the earliest book that we all have, certainly from India, or maybe from all over the world in its own general, original form. I looked at it and in about half an hour, I had discovered a structure on which I was to write a book later on called the Astronomical Code of the Rig Veda. And I wrote many papers in the Royal Astronomical Society journal and in journals both East and West. And amongst other things, I discovered that the Vedic sages or rishis, you call them in Sanskrit, were aware that the sun and the moon are each 108 times their respective diameter from the earth. And that's the reason why 108 is such a central figure in Indian culture. For example, in Bharatanatyam, the Indian classical dance, there are 108 dance poses. In the Indian rosary, which is called a Japamala, there are 108 beads. And there are 108 names of the god or the goddess, because basically what you're doing is doing a symbolic journey from Earth, which is your body, to the inner sun. Because, as I said, 108 times the diameter of the sun is the distance to the sun. So all of this got me started. And uh, this was the early 90s or mid 90s I became I think it became quite famous. I traveled all over the world to every university that you could think of, gave speeches uh, and, and so on. And, uh, and so that has continued on the side, study of myth, because myth and astronomy are connected all over, whether you go to Europe or you go to the Incas or the uh, Aztecs and certainly uh, India as well. Uh, but 
in a certain sense, I came back to what my original starting point was in uh, the early 2000s, which was to go back and look at information and quantum mechanics. So I started working on a quantum computing. And most recently, three years ago, another of those uh, out of the box moment when I asked myself, you know, we take, and this was the beginning of the pandemic. I was stuck in my daughter's home in Miami, tossing and turning at night. And I had been invited to a logic conference in Austria a couple of years prior to give a keynote, even though I hadn't worked on logic, but in order to at least know what these guys work on. So I looked up logic and I discovered that there is a mathematical logic theorem which says that um, the, if you look at integers, the three-way logic is superior to binary logic, which is why in the 1970s, there were scientists who were trying to construct hardware for computers based on three-way logic, but that train had already passed on. They, there was too much of an investment on binary logic, so people abandoned it. But then I also discovered the theorem says that three is better than two, but optimal is E, which is 2.718. So, and that moment was sort of, uh, was was a kind of an epiphany and I then uh, went back and looked at cosmology and here you are you solve some fundamental crises of cosmology like the different values of the Hubble constant if you um, use this new view now this view what it really means is that that our senses see it as three-dimensional, but reality is 2.718 dimensional. And that's what is also responsible for gravity. So it's another way of looking at gravity. And most recently, since both of you are in life sciences, so to speak, you know, general uh, label, I figured that if the outside uh, reality is determined or has a measure of 2.718, so should be biologic, so should biological reality. So it should also have an understand Im implications for the genetic code. And just on 4th July, I had a paper in theory and biosciences where I explained one of the biggest mysteries of the genetic code based on e-dimensionality. So this is my path. So in other words, what I've been driven by our fundamental questions, both related to the outer world, outer reality, and inner reality. And in many ways, my study of uh, the Indian texts, because uh, the Vedas proclaim themselves to be the science of consciousness, and consciousness is the frontier of all sciences right now. So they seem to come together. And, and so that's been a very satisfactory uh, element of my journey. Can you unpack the 2.718 dimensions a little bit? Oh, sure. Uh, th this is a mathematical theorem. And uh, what it says is that if you uh, had, let's say many bins, if you had many bins and you put items in it, what would be the most efficient way of representing information? Okay. And it so turns out that if you had now, of course, if you had integer number of bins, then three bins are more efficient than two bins. Now, you know, uh, zeros and ones in which computer information is written is binary representation. So ternary, meaning three, is more efficient than binary by, I think, 18% or so. But if you could have... Uh, bins which were which admitted fractionals uh, uh, so that fraction of one could also be a part of it then e dimensions which is 2.718 is optimal now of course one would say what does it really mean how could space be e dimensional not three dimensional is there a mathematics to it yes uh, in fact some of the biggest uh, advances that have taken place in physics, elementary particle physics from the 1970s onwards, uh, do at least in their analysis, admit the possibility of non-integer uh, dimensions. Uh, and so there is a mathematics of it, which says that non-integer dimensional reality is mathematically consistent, which means logically consistent. 
So, but that is not, my work is not on the mathematics of it. My work, as you, as I've told you, is more on uh, implications of this. And the very first paper that I published in Nature's Scientific Reports in uh, 2000 November, 2020 November, looked at this problem of Hubble constant, if you look at it from uh, the uh, microwave background radiation, which is supposed to have begun from the earlier, earliest moment uh, at the Big Bang, and from the data that we have on how fast stars are receding from each other, and these are called candles in uh, astronomical or cosmological uh, parlance, then there is a difference of a ratio of 0 0.9, and they have tried their best, that has been called a crisis. And 0 0.9, if, if you take three-dimensional data and reduce it to one dimension, speed is just one dimension. 2.7 divided by 3 is 0 0.9. And that is precisely what the difference is. That when we look at the motion of the stars, we are, cons we are using a three-dimensional frame to look at the motion of stars. So we impose three-dimensionality. But in reality, when you look at microwave background radiation, that is its inherent speed. So that speed is different from this one by a factor of 0 0.9. So it all squares up. And not only that, it also solves an incredible, the, the big biggest crisis that science is facing right, now, facing right now, which is the crisis that emerged in the late 1990s when it was found that not only is the universe expanding, accelerate, uh, expanding, you know, it's been expanding right from the beginning, but its expansion accelerated about 5 billion years ago. And if it's accelerating, this means that the whole universe will die a cold death because the stars will keep on receding and receding and receding. And at some future time, uh, the question would then be, what is universe? You know, what is the meaning of it all? Now, when I apply e-dimensionality theory to it, we, first of all, our results are totally consistent with what has happened in the past. And it turns out that indeed, five billion years ago, uh, the universe is, the, the expansion started to accelerate. But it also shows that in the next billion years or so, the acceleration will eventually uh, slow down and then reverse, and therefore order will be restored on a global scale. So that, this is very sat satisfactory. And this has also been published. You know, these all have gone to various journals and they've been reviewed. And, and, and so it, it's very, very interesting. But right now, my focus is more on the genetic code and chromatin, for example. The, the very organization of the DNA in the nucleus cell nucleus has a fractional dimension of exactly 2.7 and you can look it up this is incredible well that's i mean it's called isn't it it's a natural constant right do you see this in growth curves and uh all right. throughout nature in terms of dynamics right e is a very important number it's it's involved in all of the thermodynamics equations the Arrhenius expressions it's a very well-known ratio uh that seems to keep cropping up all over the place um yeah, I'm definitely interested in the biological stuff. The the cosmological situation, I mean, the two pillars of the Big Bang are are under various degrees of assault right now. What what were you gonna say, Nastya? Okay. Yeah. Uh I, I'm not personally entirely persuaded of this whole Big Bang thing myself. Um we actually have a a uh, a gentleman coming on. Maybe you saw this article, uh this guy in Vancouver who's uh proposed a different solution um where he's essentially extending the length of the universe by yeah yeah i know but uh, the the real problem uh, which i forgot to mention is that in order to explain the acceleration of the cosmos um, and to explain the anomalous motion of the stars in various galaxies um, physicists have been compelled to introduce dark matter and dark energy Dark matter is supposed to be about 28% uh, uh, of the universe, and dark energy is supposed to be 68. Taken together, they are 96%. There is another 3.5% of interstellar dust, which doesn't come into equation, so that's 99.5%. So current physics can only explain 0.5% of the visible universe. Now, my theory of e-dimensionality 
doesn't require either dark matter or dark energy. So that's that's very interesting. Now, of course, you know, all of science, as you correctly pointed out in the beginning, is a conversation. There is no settled science. So this is where we stand now, and we need to see where all this conversation goes. But as I mentioned to you, this idea of E dimensionality, and E, as you said, is Euler's constant. It's a natural number. Uh, this uh, uh, this um, uh, idea is sort of uh, going forward. Uh, you know, it it's, it's rests on a mathematical theorem, on sound logic. Because mathematics means logic, a mathematical, logical idea. And in my view, I think it's most interesting. And the very fact that one can look at both the cosmos as well as the genetic code is very intriguing. And, uh, and we need to see where it all goes further from this point on. And that's what I'm working on right now. So in other words, my work has sort of spanned many different fields uh, from computer science. I've worked on AI, neural networks. I worked on astronomy, uh, ancient uh, India, and uh, comparisons with um, Babylonian and Greek astronomy. I also looked at Peruvian stuff, uh, their astronomy, and and then um, come back, done quantum computing, which a lot of people are working on. And in my view, quantum computers will never be built for some fundamental reasons. And, and then finally, back to uh, information. What is information? What is consciousness? That is the question. Because all of reality that we know exists in our consciousness. The Demystify Sci podcast is supported by viewers like you. And so if you are listening to this show and you are wondering what you can do to help support the podcast, think no more and come on over to patreon.com slash demystify sci. For just a couple dollars a month, you can help us keep the ship going. And in return, you get both of our episodes early, you get them on Saturdays, and you get access to our weekly patron chat that is really growing into something incredible where we get together every week and we talk to our listeners, not just about the co topics that we cover on the podcast, but basically any of the other big questions that are hanging over their heads. And it's a place where we're really starting to develop where we go next. And so it's a really amazing thing, and we hope that you come and join us. If you don't have any cash to spare right now, that is totally fine. You can find us on Facebook, Discord, and Twitter. And by joining the communities there, you can get in on the action. You can leave a YouTube comment to help us with the algorithm. Or, most importantly, you can just tell a friend. We grow by word of mouth, and that helps us more than anything else. With that, back to Subhash Kak. Right? And in fact, this is what the Vedas say, since you did bring up the question of what is Vedic cosmos. All of knowledge exists in our consciousness, and consciousness is a property associated with our brain, and the brain is dark. If you shut your eyes, there's no light in the brain. Of course, there is electrical activity, but there's no light. So, uh, according to the Vedic view, consciousness is a transcendent property of reality. You have physical reality, plus you have consciousness. And consciousness, if you use the metaphor of light, consciousness is what illuminates the contents of the brain. And of course, if the brain gets damaged, then that illumination doesn't take place. So, a person can see alters or can have is if there's a stroke then a person's mind uh, is not uh, capable uh, anymore um, and and um, there are there are some very interesting things happening uh, that happen for example there can be injury to the brain um, or, or a stroke and a person can lose the capacity to read and this is called alexia but in some patients you can have alexia without a graphia so that you can not read, but you can still write so long as you're not looking at paper, at the paper. Hmm. Okay. So in other words, this idea is that, that consciousness as one uh, provides us the capacity to be, of course, different minds and different minds are because of different uh, uh, histories that each one of us has. And, and the biological capacity that we have. So, so it all, in my view, it all hangs together in a very, uh, to me, extraordinary and 
satisfactory way. And in this, in many ways, I'm not an outlier because the creator, one of the two creators of quantum mechanics was an Austrian physicist named Erwin Schrodinger, uh, who was also a Vedantin. And in his famous book, What is Life? Uh, he insists on this. He says, look, the only logical way of understanding consciousness is to see it as a unity. And he says, of course, uh, this is this is considered this would be considered blasphemous in certain traditions. But I think uh, my own, my own research and I have many other newer papers which are going to be published uh, in the next few months in the leading journal in the field called Journal of AI and Consciousness, where uh, all of what I'm telling you does get um, uh, justified mathematically or logically because that's what a scientific paper is all about you have to uh, you have to have a hypothesis and then you have to provide evidence which back up that hypothesis i mean i think that the strangeness of mathematics is a particularly difficult puzzle to solve because it doesn't seem inevitable that there would be these constants that you can discover that are foundational and that appear in place to place to place. And so it does seem that once you discover them, that there is a deeper significance there. But I've always wondered if it isn't just a side effect of the basement of physical reality, where that's just how objects must come together. And because of their shapes, because of their electrostatic interactions, because of the atoms bumping into one another, that's just how it's going to always look no matter where it happens and that there's not a greater and deeper significance to it. It's just a fractal replay of the same phenomenon from size scale to size scale. Now, Anastasia, what you're saying is certainly uh, true. And uh, Eugene Wigner, another giant of the 20th century physics, wrote a very famous paper on it called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. You know, one wonders, uh, here is activity in our brain, which is our you know, conscious thoughts, etc., which is a small part of our body, which is a small element on this earth, which is a speck of dust in this cosmos. How is it even possible? This is a question that, um, you know, that people have asked, and it's a very reasonable question to ask. Now, there are two ways of looking at it, and the one that you mentioned that Okay, you can look at reality as physical, and there should be it, it should be possible for us to abstract properties of this physical cosmos using reasonable assumptions. And that's what mathematics is, right? You say it's a set, that there are different objects, and these objects have relationships um, mutually, right? And I totally agree with that. But now what my researches in consciousness and Indian cosmology or astronomy or Vedas, because basically they claim that we are, we are speaking of nothing but Atma Vidya, which is science of consciousness. Mm. So what it, what it, where is the meeting ground? The meeting ground is that if indeed, as the Vedas claim, there is something transcend, transcendent, and that is where consciousness comes in. And then there is the embodied physical universe. Now, the transcendent aspect of reality is absorbed by us uh, in our minds because mind, mind is physical. And so the, the way it's absorbed, the way this illumination is uh, sensed by us, uh, should follow the structure of the mind, of the, the physical structure, which is, of course, you know, related to atoms and their relationships. So whatever arguments we come up with should have an analogous um, description in uh, properties of objects. And so, I'm, so that's why I'm also a physical a theorist, a physicist, right, or a computer scientist. But now what uh, my take on all of this to the extent it's important is that, look, uh, consciousness and physicality are like two sides of a coin. So you can either look at it only from the physics perspective or chemistry perspective or biology perspective, right? There are the various objects. Or 
the overarching explanation can also be viewed from the consciousness perspective. And therefore, that's where information comes in. Because ultimately, all of science is a narrative on consciousness, right? Is, is, about, is a narrative on information. How do we receive information? Or how much of information resides in this object or that object, right? And how and accurate is our information? Stage. And how accurate is our information? So, uh, so this uh, question of information, and that's why I'm sort of quite uh, uh, wedded to this idea of e-dimensionality, right? This is the view, this is the overarching view of reality. And this overarching view of reality should work both uh, uh, at the level of the cosmos, as uh, I've argued, but also at the level of biological information, because that's also information. So I, 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 I think, uh, and, and then there's a third perspective, which we didn't mention, which is that where do ideas come from? Mm. Right? Now, now, one, uh, in, from a psychology perspective, you could say, uh, well, you have uh, hypotheses, you have axioms, you have a certain framework, whether formal or informal. And within that framework, you tinker with various assumptions, etc. And then you come up with some other arrangement. But, uh, but you know, if you look at how, I forget his first name, not Jeff, Jeffrey, what, who, the guy who started out, H-O-W-E, who started out the industrial revolution in the world, he was a... Uh, he was the guy, he was an American who invented the first sewing machine. Mm. And he claimed that he saw this vision where he saw these uh, Native Americans. Uh, they had, he had been dragged to be cooked, right? Or whatever, you know, let's, let's forget that, um, what is not, that, which is not a uh, politically correct aspect of the story. Uh, as, uh, you know, cannibals were going to kill him. And, and uh, they had these lances and the eye of the lance or the tip of the lance had an eye. And he woke up and he immediately realized that the needle that he needed to have for the sewing machine had to have an eye. And I think he patented it. That created the revolution because suddenly women didn't have to darn clothes or sew the entire day, change the universe. And that came from somewhere outside. Or the famous story in the 1850s, Cacules, benzene. He saw a dream. Um, he saw a dream. I don't know whether he was a professor. Maybe he was a professor. As a longtime professor, I can tell you that when we are in our offices, we are generally sleeping off if we are not day trading. So when we are dozing, that's when we get some of these great ideas. So I suppose that's how he got this idea. Or look, why nobody until now had ever in any tradition had ever thought of physical reality being anything less than three-dimensional, anything but three-dimensional. Even Einstein didn't change that. He only said, well, the three-dimensional physical space gets curved if there is a mass uh, inside the space, right? But e-dimensionality, it came from outside. Clearly, we are only a medium. Do you see that? This is my take that we, any human being, uh, and every human being is on equal ground there. We are only a medium, and this is it's through us that consciousness, this unity of consciousness, and you might prefer to call that unity God, or whatever else, you know, that's up to you, or your deity, whichever tradition you come from. So... Can I ask you? Can I just uh, pause us, you? Through us. Can I just ask you what do you sure. what's what do you, how do you define consciousness? What is consciousness? Just so I can make sure we're on the same page. Very, very good question. Consciousness is our awareness, right? Mm -hmm. And this aware, what is awareness? Awareness in our thoughts are the contents associated with it. You know, like thoughts. Uh, you think of something, then you think of something else, and uh, these thoughts arise and then they die, right? But the but the, what gives us the capacity to have these thoughts is consciousness. It's not a mathematical theorem, which is why uh, people who work in consciousness, and there are many, now it's become fashionable to work in it since the 1990s. So if you're a psychologist, uh, you could even say that there are different states of consciousness. You can, be, you can be in a state of coma, and perhaps some of these coma patients can still see, although they cannot communicate. Right. So there are many different states or your the sleep state is also a consciousness state, accepting that in the sleep state, you're not uh, 
governed by the laws that exist terrestrially. You can you can think of worlds where you can fly or various things happen. And um, one of the most famous uh, Upanishads, if you have heard of the term Upanishad, Upanishads are these dialogue books which explain what the Vedas are. And one of these Upanishads speaks about uh, four states of consciousness. One is, of course, uh, the awake state. The second is the um, dream state. The third is the deep sleep state. And of course, in, in physiology, we have uh, uh, REM sleep and uh, non-REM sleep and so on. So it does correspond to it. But the, uh, the commentary on this Upanishad says that, look, it's in the dream sleep, dream state that your consciousness, your individual consciousness, which is normally within the straight jacket of what you have learned and what you have been told is correct. It is liberated. Now, dream state does not necessarily mean only when you're laying in your bed and sleeping. It could also be day trances or imagination. That's where out of the box ideas come to you. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think my own personal experience or the experience of many scientists or, or artists or musicians or painters from all cultures speak of ideas coming from outside. In fact, a famous uh, French mathematician by name uh, Brillouin, uh, no, Hadamard. Hadamard, he, uh, this is about a hundred years ago, he wrote to the leading uh, mathematicians of his time and he said, can you tell me when did you get the great discovery that you made? And most of them said spontaneously. Sometimes I was just walking or I was sleeping or I was dreaming. And I think this itself at least informs us in some sense about what the mystery is. If reality is a mystery, and one aspect of it is, of course, the physical reality that we see around us, but the other aspect of this reality is, is the very capacity that we have to see this reality, which is consciousness. Okay, that's another definition for you. I guess uh, just to unpack the, this a little bit, to walk it back a tiny bit. So do you imagine that less complex organisms have varied states of consciousness as well? Like, does a bacteria have dreams? Are there different states? Or is that purely a structural element of our complex neurochemistry that provides for that specific ability? Uh, I believe that the higher mammals certainly have a consciousness just like us, even though they're probably not able to do calculus. Although uh, there are some very clever experiments which say that the ravens can count up to 10 or something and so on. But certainly lower organisms, you know, you need a certain, as you said, um, structures inside the brain for uh, dreaming to take place. So certainly uh, that doesn't occur. But a, a correspondent of mine um, uh, by name Bjorn Merker, uh, who got his PhD in neuroscience from MIT in the 1980s, he just, just two weeks ago, he wrote to me, about something else. Uh, he's retired now. He lives in, uh, in, in Sweden. And he's, he had sent me some stuff on uh, his own personal journey. And then uh, Googling him, I discovered that he had written a uh, well-known paper, very highly cited about 10 years ago, arguing for, and the title of the paper, if I remember correctly, is Consciousness Without the Cortex. That perhaps the limbic system itself is also conscious and there are some very clever uh, scientific experiments that have been done. So I do believe uh, that while our human consciousness is unique, but so is the consciousness of, uh, uh, of um, uh, you know, um, other mammals. And in fact, um, a famous study, which I have quoted uh, elsewhere, this experiment on uh, certain primates in Japan, which establishes that uh, these primates are able to respond to stimuli much faster than humans. You know, they had to create, complete a sequence on the screen and they do it so much faster than humans can. So clearly their senses, sens sensory systems are, are pretty good, pretty good. I guess the question is what, 
the simplest solution is just that we have these structural elements that allow for us to make these rapid connections. And, you know, when I'm struck by the fact that, oh, I had this idea or this music appeared to me that I'm really just associating using these complex structures in my brain to associate all of my experiences and all of the stimuli that I've received over the course of my life and just coming, you know, I have the machinery to make these connections happen. Whereas maybe a bacteria doesn't have those. Absolutely. No, no, I, I agree with that. And uh, we also do know that, uh, that uh, animals other than humans also are charmed by music. Mm. You know, there are any number of uh, YouTube videos on uh, a, a guitarist playing to cows or goats and so on. And they come all, to you know, congregate together no absolutely so we do have special structures and this whole to go back to the whole question of the vedic view the vedic view um, first of all maybe it's a coincidence accepts that this particular cycle of creation is about the same 10 15 billion years as modern cosmology but the vedic view also acknowledges that physical structures go through evolution and uh, and so we stand at the end of a certain evolutionary process. So we have the capacity, but what it um, uh, argues is that um, this evolution uh, is driven in some sense by a reaching out to consciousness. And this brings me to an interesting point uh, that uh, I had missed uh, mentioning. Uh, a question could be asked, and um, and uh, and the question is this: If consciousness is transcendent, and physical reality is not, then how can the two of them interact? I think Leibniz also had a uh, in his uh, study uh, uh, when he spoke about uh, mental states had had a similar uh, question. So how can the transcendent interact with the physical? Um, and this is something I've written research papers also on. Uh, a very good friend of mine who just passed away a couple of years ago, a very famous um, uh, Indian physicist named uh, George Sudarshan in the 1970s, wrote a paper, and it's called The Quantum Zeno Effect, where he showed that just by the process of observation, a person can steer the state of a physical system, even though the physical system is completely autonomous. The Schrodinger's equation determines the evolution of the quantum system, which is a deterministic equation. But by the process of observation, you can either freeze the state or you can steer it to where you want it to go. And this is an idea which has also been a part of the Vedic tradition. And it goes back at least 2000 years ago, where um, the question was asked, why do you need deities you know these are of course um, names for for fundamental forces if you will right what does uh, god if you will or vishnu or shiva shiva is another name for consciousness for example mm -hmm. why do you need shiva if physical reality is all completely consistent and completely dependent on itself for its evolution so the answer that was given within the um, uh, tradition was that Creation is done through uh, through uh, through observation. In Sanskrit, it's called drishti srishti vada. Drishti means seeing. Srishti means creation. So creation emerges from the seeing of this uh, global or universal consciousness. The way that seeing is changed changes. In some sense, the probabilities in quantum mechanics are probabilities, probabilities that guide the evolution of the physical system. So let's unpack that I, because it, I think that aesthetically, it's oh no, aesthetically, it's hold on, finish your thought. It's very very interesting aesthetically. We don't know, you know, scientifically, of course, there's a mathematical stuff, but that's within the framework framework of quantum mechanics. But aesthetically, to argue that the physical reality is all governed by laws. But in some sense, we are able to transform it through uh, the way we observe it. The way we observe it, we change it. 
certainly to the extent we can over on this earth but otherwise if uh, there is a uh, cosmic analog to our individual consciousness that's how cosmic consciousness uh, shiva or whatever else you want to call it uh, steers the universe without physically doing anything you don't need anybody to do something this is how systems change we were actually just talking about this. We meet with our patrons once a week and somebody brought up this idea of stigmergy, which is the emergence of complex patterns without any kind of external coordination. You see this in ants and other hive animals where there's not somebody who's standing there and you know waving those flags that they wave when the plane comes in. It's just this flow of bodies that understand what the landscape is driving them to, they follow a landscape, honestly. I think that that's what it is. And that can be a landscape of a scent trail or that can be the landscape of energy wells or whatever you want to call it. But there is some confirmation that things will fall into. And so what you say about consciousness as being transcendent and how do you contain the transcendent with the physical, like where is the intersection of those two things, is very interesting to me because you then follow up to say that there is a relationship between consciousness and vision and the ability to see things. And as you see things, you are reaching into something that is larger than you, right? So you as the, the individual life form are the transformer because you have the sensory system that allows you to look at the universe and then to connect to something larger, right? The body of ideas is somewhere floating above larger than us. And we are the conduits through which interpretation occurs. And very, oh, go ahead. Very well said, beautifully said. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, and colony. You know, you have the soldiers. You have this or that. This somehow sense humans also. We are really not different from ants or other such systems. There is something in the air. You know, it's like something in the air right now. Uh, People, people with PhDs uh, who've done hard sciences are suddenly saying uh, in on their podcast that, yeah, there are 52 genders, right? Which they wouldn't have said 10 years ago. So there's something in the air. Uh, it also works for, for humans as a social system. And I think that in the air, which is above us, and in fact, you know, you said the vision system, which is able to see, which it wasn't able to see. And we are not necessarily talking of the outer directed vision system, but the inner directed vision mm -hmm. system, right? Which is where perhaps consciousness works most effectively because the outer directed vision system is sort of um, forced uh, to a great extent to accept outer reality as it is. Unless there's a fog or unless um, unless there's a fire on Maui and somehow people start behaving very, or the government says you can't go out, right? And you turn back and get incinerated. There's something that happens to the brains of people, right? So indeed, uh, what is it? what is it with our inner vision? And how do you clarify it? And maybe science is that process. To come back to what you said in the beginning, you know, you have reality beyond words. In fact, in, um, in Sanskrit thought, what is stated is that there are two aspects of reality. One is para, para likes far, far meaning transcendent. The other is apara, which is not transcendent. For, tra for the non-transcendent apara, you need language because all of apara is determined by laws and by associations and relationships. But para is reality of the experiencing self and the self is not an object so there cannot be a language which will explain what consciousness is because consciousness is the light by which we see reality so consciousness is the vision which allows us to see things as they are in our mind and perhaps also to direct our outer senses in a way which others had not seen. And we can see that as the path of science over the past two, 300 years, right? 100 years ago or 120 years ago, people didn't believe that there were electrons, right? Or there were all of these objects. But once this idea came into the mind, then people started looking for that. And then that was seen. And in fact, um, there's, there's also 
the notion which I'm sure you're aware of, uh, the notion in art, history of art. When you look at uh, the great medieval European paintings, you find uh, a prefiguration of things that emerge later in science. You know, these artists talking of doing things which were not a part of established knowledge at that particular time. So to that extent, you know, that's why poets are generally sometimes called visionaries mm. because their uh, consciousness is not sort of straight jacketed by what is supposed to be the received wisdom. You know, TM science, only do this. CDC has said this, so this is the only truth. So, uh, so people are not allowed in modern and standard science. You're not allowed to question the priesthood. But look at the Galileo period, right? You're not allowed to do it. And I think in some ways, the more things change, the more rem they remain the same. In many ways, medieval Europe was not all that different from modern day United States, you know, where, with all this canceled culture and you are not allowed to think of this and that and that. It probably and smells only nicer. what we are told, telling you is the truth. It probably smells nicer, but I agree that there's, that there's definitely problems. I, one of the <laughs> things that I really struggle with is the idea that consciousness can be separate from living beings. There's a, cause there's a dualism to this mindset, which is that there is something that is beyond life that life can touch and transduce and bring into the physical, as opposed to there being a non-duality, which is that the consciousness emerges from the physical objects that are organized into something that looks like life. And no one has uh, yeah. been successfully able to explain to me a mechanistic version of a dualist cosmos. Yeah, uh, yeah. this is this is something. Uh, I have a new paper coming out on it, uh, which could be extremely important, where I, using mathematics, I have two theorems. The title of the paper is No-Go Theorems in Machine Consciousness, where I show mathematically why there can be only one consciousness. But uh, but that's for a different uh, time, and I'll send you uh, the link when once it's published in the next few weeks. Uh, the difficulty that you mentioned arises from the fact that uh, you implicitly assume that consciousness is something like us. That I it's also that it, I, I don't think that it's like us. I literally that think... That it is somewhere here. No, no. That it's sort of separate from us. If it is something like this, you know, consciousness, first of all, is not a property, right? But let, let me just complete my thought. Okay. Uh, it's, if, it's, if it's transcendent, if it's transcendent, then it's everywhere. It's it's everywhere. It's in all over the universe because it's not sure. a property of space and time. No, I think I that? think that it is a property of matter, though. I think that it is a no, property. No, no, no. So, it's not so, a property so, of matter. Ability, right? It's an ab okay. So we hold said on. it's awareness. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's go back to like abiotic Earth. There's nothing. It's right. just rocks, lava, protoplanetary disk. Meteorites are raining down, seas are boiling, things are cooling. At some point, is there an origin of life? Well, um, rather than uh, answer that directly, let me say that all of this, the evolution of that, um, uh, that early Earth is driving to a form so that eventually there would be forms on Earth which would be able to be one with consciousness. So that consciousness expresses itself or is interpenetrates, that's the word, interpenetrates all of reality. And in fact, the view, which is of course rather, uh, rather very dramatic, the view within the Vedic cosmology, since you did uh, interview, uh, I don't know how much of, uh, or what particular understanding of Vedic cosmos he had, uh, in Vedic cosmology, the whole idea of reality is this, that uh, from uh, consciousness arises what is called Akasha or space. From there arises arise the four fundamental elements. And, uh, and there is a whole cycle of so many billion years. And at the end of it, the sun becomes larger and larger and the planets fall into it. It all becomes a liquid 
then it all becomes a burning fire. Then there is a big wind. Then it's absorbed back in Akash and then it absorbed back into the primal consciousness. So the source is consciousness. So it's, it's a kind of a very, what shall I say, a very uh, uh, exaggerated, if not the word, it's something too grand a scale, you know, that how is it even possible? It seems absolutely impossible even to think of it. But look, while it may, uh, it may just be a image or talking in terms of big images, what is significant about this view is that, look, Physical reality is all science ruled. There are laws of reality, laws of nature. There is no intervention of divinity in the evolution of the universe, which I think, which, which is very, very, very good. As a scientist, I like that. And as far as consciousness is concerned, that only impacts our relationship with this physical reality. And it also says there is only one consciousness. The three of us are really the same individual or any number of people. We are the same people. If there are differences in us, that's because of, first of all, we are all born with maybe different personalities based on, you know, core temperament, based on um, uh, genetic factors. But siblings uh, in the same family can be very different. We are five siblings and um, we, are, we are very different from each other. And I'm sure it's true of uh, other families as well. So, but leaving that apart, it's our conditioning and our education and possibly the way um, to use non-religious terms, the way consciousness informs us. Consciousness speaks to us. I mean, you took a decision after your PhD, you took a decision. I'm going to be on this path. So that was a signal that you received. Or every morning I wake up, I ask myself, what am I to do? I am looking, or not necessarily every morning, uh, but from time to time, where am I to go? Uh, now, of course, some people are on treadmills, you know, could be treadmill of politics, a treadmill of an academic position where all that you're thinking of every day is, okay, how many papers do I have? How many citations do I have? What do I, how do I, um, how do I uh, sort of, Monet, get that monetized, right? So they are on a treadmill and th that's the reason sometimes, you know, there's not much creative that comes out of such silos. But people who are in touch with their self, and of course, poets have talked about it in all traditions, that my mind or my spirit moved me. The spirit made me do this. So if you're in touch with your spirit, then, then you know where you have to go. Because then it's not, you're not doing it. It's not your ego, which is making you do what you're doing. You are an instrument of something higher than you. So this really makes me think of something that is missing from evolutionary theory, which is that it is just cold, hard molecules bumping against each other. The way that it is described is survival of the fittest, there's some optimum and some creature can fit that optimum better. That's the one that reproduces, has more offspring, and so its genes are passed on. And there's not an aspect inside of evolution of will and desire that the traits that are passed on are the ones that the organism wanted to pass on. Where if you have a, a family of meerkats or whatever, and there's one clan that decides, you know, we're going to do things a little bit differently. And then over time, they evolve to be a different species. That's a will that emerges that is not just governed by the bare interaction of body with the landscape. There's something that comes inside of it, which is a desire that science doesn't know how to explain. And I think that people talk about where is the origin of ideas? But then beyond that, there's also the question of what is the origin of desire? And how do you choose between all of the options that are available to you, the thing that you will move towards, because that has a consequence that is not just on the order of your life. That has an uh, that has a consequence on the order of the universe for as long as, and and I don't even think that it has necessarily to do with reproduction, because we are creatures that are able to mimetically distribute ideas and influence. And so as you do something in the world, and if it is effective and other people see it, without 
a physical connection, without a genetic connection, you are able to change their arc. And so 10,000 years from now, you might have, by virtue of your actions, created a lineage that ends up being completely different from the people that are here today. And there's a cleavage all of a sudden. Brilliantly put. Totally agree. And I do believe from, uh, you know, reading general stuff that there is criticism, a uh, critique of the neo-Darwinian synthesis along these lines, and certainly will and desire. And who was that German philosopher, Nietzsche, who talked about the reality as will and desire? Uh, uh, I, think it was, it, I think it was Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer or Nietzsche? Uh, Schopenhauer. Okay, Schopenhauer. I mean, I read um, it in... I think that uh, Nietzsche... Uh, I mean, definitely Nietzsche was talking about Nietzsche, as okay. the well, universe probably both. says, an, as will and an idea, or one of the two of them. So uh, I totally agree with you. I think this is what uh, physics or biology will have to confront more head on because the previous synthesis has run out of steam. And mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. You know, from time to time, you have to revisit where we stand. And I think in so many different ways, this is that inflection point where we are. Uh, why? Because of robotics and AI, um, it's being revealed that most of the time, humans work as AI machines. Most of our jobs, we are doing repetitive work. Humans are not needed. 60-70% uh, of the jobs in American economy, according to an estimate, are related to transportation. You already have self-driving cars. And once self-driving cars and trucks uh, uh, are employed in a big way, 60, 70 percent of the jobs will go away. In fact, I totally agree with people like Elon Musk. Maybe the population uh, of the world will drop to about a billion in the next 100 or 200 years. And people will be confronted by this question. What are we? Because what gives us comfort? What gave comfort to people in the 19th century was work, brawn work, muscle work, you worked hard and you came home and your wife and children were waiting and you got comfort uh, in, in that relationship. But now all of that is gone. No work, nobody has to do hard work. Um, and then people moved to the cities. Then they had these ledgers, they were entering, you know, data, who sold what and how much did you buy and how much had you saved. We don't need human beings for that. We don't need clerks. We don't need uh, workers uh, in the farms or elsewhere. We need a few. We don't need 8 billion. Maybe we need a few hundred billion. So this is the time when scientists, you know, just as uh, the painters of the medieval Europe uh, prefigured uh, uh, what or saw in their imagination what was going to happen to the world later on. So likewise, we on this podcast and other people like us are seeing where the world is going. And most of us, we are like AI machines. So what is our true self? That is the core, which is free within us, which is consciousness. And we don't, we're not always conscious as, you know, Shiloh, your question, what is consciousness? Most of the time we are not, we're just going, you know, sleepwalking through life or doing things, eating, doing this or that, uh, reacting, which is the karmic chain. Karmic chain. Karma means reaction. The principle of karma means principle of reacting. We are always reacting. We act only when we are free. In fact, one of the uh, inspiring and beautiful things in one of the Indian traditions, uh, Shaivite tradition, is that Shivo Aham, Sh Shivo Aham, I am Shiva, I am freedom. My true essence is freedom. And we have epiphany from time to time. You know, even dogs do. Sunrise, suddenly, there's something that happens that transforms you for the rest of your life, right? So people will realize that that's what our true self is. And that's the gift that every young boy and girl who's born should have access to and not put them on one treadmill or the other of life, right? where they are enslaved, or if you put them in really bad reaction chain, karmic chain, they can even become, you know, evil people. They can murder, you know, as murders do take place, mass murders do take place, or like, look at 9-11. Why do people do that? Why do people do horrible things? Not because they are fundamentally different from us, but because they were put, they were 
their humanity, their consciousness was separated from them. They were told, you're nothing but your bodies and your bodies must dominate all other bodies. Mm. You see that? So I think this is really one of those central moments in history because now with the technology that we have, uh, human beings can relate to that the possibility, intimation of that freedom within them because everybody has it within them. Everybody can be can do amazing stuff or creative stuff, but people don't trust themselves or have faith in themselves. Mm. And uh, when, uh, especially in American schools, American education is so horrible, uh, really tragic. Um, that's why America has to import 95% of its scientists and engineers from India and China. Why? Why isn't America doing it for themselves? Why are American schools such so that kids in their middle school, they're told you can only aspire to do this or that. They don't have faith in themselves. They are too scared of STEM or science. This is why is this happening? I, I think the time has come where in every society and culture, if they are told that indeed you can do it, you and everybody else are the same. You have the same glorious potential that anybody else has. Wouldn't that be liberating and wonderful? Hmm. One thing that worries me is just whether or not science has the capacity to actually address that naughty word that you mentioned earlier called spirit, right? I mean, you can't actually put the word spirit into a scientific publication, but in essence, spirit is really just synonymous with ideation or, you know, anything behavioral. It's a relational word. It talks about the patterns that appear behaviorally. And, you know, as science took off in the 20th century and really became the guiding force in politics and nation building and decision making and exploration, people started to also turn away from churches, right? People turned away from religion. And now I feel like the general public, at least in America, they look to science as if it is almost the voice of God, right? And it worries me because I'm not sure that science is really equipped. To, I don't think scientists themselves are really equipped to deal with the issues of spirit. And so I see a situation where there's kind of a vacuum that appears. And of course, there are some quantum physicists and so forth that are willing to, to dive into that topic. But as a whole, it doesn't seem to be fully equipped with the tools to address issues of how we should be living, what's the best way to, you know, these unsolved problems, how do I have a good marriage? How do I have a good day, right? Those are very, very tricky things for science to get involved with. And consciousness seems to be at the forefront of that. So I, I'm, in, I'm curious uh, how you think that science can pull that off. It, it, do, or do we need a parallel system to guide us through these trials, right? Maybe not a religion, but some other practice that's capable of working inside of this sphere that's not, right? Because how do you actually objectively talk about inner experience? It's very difficult to study. Science has a really hard time. They can give you surveys, but the questions are leading. You know, you can design a survey so you can basically get whatever you want. Um, I guess that's probably an exaggeration, but it's <laughs> something like that. Um, social sciences are notoriously squishy and they have more retractions than anybody else. People are constantly being found out to be baiting their studies. And so, yeah, do, do you really think that science can handle consciousness? Yeah, well, uh, very, very good uh, point that you make, Shiloh. Uh, science, what is science? Uh, the, the, and I totally agree with you, the whole idea of ideation. How science works is two ideas. And uh, but one can also say that how consciousness itself works to us, because consciousness is not a thing. If you even, you know, poetically, you say consciousness is the light which illuminates our mind. So we cannot talk about that light. We can only talk about the way that illumination occurs, right? And that's the ideation. So the whole challenge then is to be connected to the universal, to ask the deepest questions. You know, like Anastasia asked the question about, you know, how could just random rearrangement of molecules lead to the kind of complexity that uh, a, a physical, a, a biological organism is, even the simplest biological organisms. 
If you look at the probabilities, the prob probabilities are so small that um, it couldn't have happened. So there's got to be something more. There's got to be something which is missing in uh, in the in that aspect of science. Now, what has happened? Uh, Maybe uh, beginning after Darwin, uh, this this whole idea of survival of the fittest of objects and machines, and the idea of machines being so successful, that and now with computers being so successful, um, people have uh, internalized the idea that we are machines. And in fact, I can tell you a little story on this. Uh, five six years ago, DARPA through SRI, uh, organized a whole set of conferences, uh, week-long uh, conferences across the US and one in Cambridge, UK as well. They invited some leading people, you know, biologists, uh, computer scientists, physicists, philosophers, and some DARPA managers. And the charge that was given to us was, and I was one of them, they said, uh, uh, can you, discuss this question of whether computers of the future will be conscious and not necessarily computers five years from now but potentially you know theoretically in principle 100 years from now thousand years from now so we met and we discussed from so many different uh, perspectives people presented um, you know the latest findings and then we took a poll um, and this is in cambridge i was there too and uh, half the people uh, raised their hands and they said, yeah, computers will be conscious because um, you know, computers uh, uh, will slowly emulate more and more systems within the brain and as, uh, as, as more and more modules. And once it crosses a certain threshold, the complexity crosses a certain threshold, computers will be conscious. And the other half, and these are the people, some of them from philosophy, some of them from quantum mechanics, and I was there wearing the quantum mechanics hat and computer science hat. And we said, no, that's not going to happen because the interpretation of quantum mechanics itself is that reality has two aspects. One is the physical struct systems, the other is consciousness. The observer is always outside of the physical system, even in classical mechanics, even if you do Newton, right? So the whole challenge right now is that, okay, but I forgot to tell you, that all the people agreed, all the people agreed on that panel, agreed that pe that society and individuals will be more accepting of computers taking control of more and more aspects of life, or we will cede control to uh, computers. And that's happening in this new reset that some people, you know, WEF and others are contemplating that, that there should be a certain uh, aristocracy, if you will, or bureaucracy of wise people who will then govern how the world should uh, run, how, how the world should be run. Mm. And that is totally uh, in um, opposition to this idea of freedom within consciousness. Now, the problem that has occurred now is that we are, the computers are so successful that we will be, we will give experts, so-called experts, and experts don't know it all. Even biologists who do evolution don't know it all. E even in logic, mathematical logic, um, there are uh, theorems which can't be proven or disproven. You know, the famous Goodell's incompleteness theorem. The layperson doesn't know this. Layperson has complete faith in science. In reality, as you started out in the beginning, is that science is a continuing conversation. It is where things change because what illuminates our understanding is some, if you accept my view that it's transcendent, in any way it is infinite. It's the infinite informing what is finite, which is our conceptual space, right? But if we cede authority to computers, that is going to be a very dangerous time for society and for individuals. Right. So, uh, so science, what people like us perhaps have to do is to keep on pushing back and saying that no, science is a never ending journey. Mm. And uh, we, that uh, science is, that we are not what 
you know, what, what, we, what we are being told. Even neuroscience, where is the self? You can't find the self anywhere. You're doing fMRI. You don't find self at any specific place, right? So where is the self? So we must be humble enough to accept uh, that uh, science uh, is uh, not the last word, science at any particular moment. And that humility is what will show us the way to where we should be going. Yeah, what strikes me as uniquely human and, and impossible for the machines to, or at least has not been demonstrated in any iota, is the ability for them to explore unknown problems. Because that's what humans and conscious entities do, as far as I can tell, that's different from computers. Computers and really, honestly, like really good test-taking students, people who excel often in STEM, they're really good at defined problems, right? If you say, here's a problem, help me solve it. The computers, the really smart, brilliant mathematicians can do that. Uh, but when it comes to addressing a problem that you didn't know was there and picking it out and being like, hey, wait a second, here's, here's another thing that nobody's working on and maybe we should work on it. That seems to be uniquely human and I don't see machines making any foray into that kind of thought. And it's a really neglected form of intelligence. This uh, gentleman we had on the show, he's a scholar at Columbia right now. His name's Adam Mastroianni. He divides it into the uh, this space of undefined problems versus defined problems. And in the undefined problems, there's not a lot of currency in our society, right? These are problems, like I was saying earlier, how to have a good day, how to have a good marriage, how to have a fulfilling life. Those, those require, if you look at the people who have pulled that off, they're very intelligent people. Now, they might not be very good at taking the SAT, necessarily. They might not have risen up through the career ladder. They have a very different kind of intelligence. And that's an intelligence which doesn't get a lot of play in these AI discussions. And so I, I am also skeptical that computers will ever be able to achieve that because it doesn't seem like it's an issue that the programmers are fixated on. I think that the programmers are fixated on it. Because when we talked to Carl Friston, they were talking about how to encode all of the various human experiences as mathematical formula that can then be used for machine learning and artificial intelligence to simulate these states. And so if they could get the mathematical definition of it, then they would be able to to emulate it. Well, they're, ch they're going to chase those states, but are... Are those computers ever going to be able to look out on the entire landscape of the universe and discover unknown problems and propose solutions to them? I think that when the when they're integrated with our biological hardware, when you have an in when you have a silico chip that is welded into the wetware of the human body, then you will have computers that are capable of it because and because I've talked to you about this before. I think that there's something inherent about the biological system itself that gives you these abilities. That That's what I'm saying. Then at that point, it's just like a, a tool that the human is using. So it's still fundamentally alive. Oh, I think that you start to lose your ability to say where the human begins and the machine ends. If you like, So for example, I can imagine this super far distant transhumanist future what we've figured out how to do is we've figured out how to put a genomic sequence into our own DNA that allows us to biosynthetically produce the neural implant that then connects us to the antennas that are all over the place. You're producing that. You know, we have, we, let's say that suddenly we have a, a higher vitamin necessity for silicon. And so you, you basically, you have the biosynthetic pathway woven into the human genome and then the difference between human and computer is non-existent and that is the place where machines become intelligent well but uh, good, uh, good points but uh, even then uh, the human would become a more efficient machine because i totally grant you this we are machines we are in most of what we do maybe 95 percent of what we do we are like ai machines and this discovery itself is going to be very frightening to the average person, certainly to the young people, who, which is one of the reasons why they are so confused, right? So we are, but what the point I'm making is that 
consciousness is not emergent. And, and, and let me give you uh, the gist of the paper, which is going to appear in the next uh, next couple of months. The gist is this. If uh, consciousness is a property of complexity, then you can imagine a machine, a complex machine, you created it, which, whether it's uh, biological, you know, cell-based, biology cell-based or whatever else. So this machine has become com uh, conscious. But now you can imagine this complex hardware or circuitry being a part of a larger machine, which also has complexity higher than that threshold. Then you have this paradox of a conscious machine, which is a subset of another conscious machine, which by, log by uh, according to logic is, is, is impossible. In fact, this is the very heart of my paper, uh, no go theorems on machine consciousness, that a conscious machine cannot be a subset of another conscious machine, which means a conscious machine cannot be a product of complexity. Because if you have a uh, physical complexity uh, that you created in a machine, then you can also make a larger machine of which this machine is a part. Right? But, but you and I are totally in agreement that we are machines as well and our minds are machines. The activity in our minds are machines. So we have information. And of course, the difference between us and an AI machine is that we have ego. We have that I-ness, which a silicon machine doesn't have. And that I-ness is that center of awareness, right? I think and that, the that I -ness, is where... I, I think that the I-ness comes also from lineage. Like, I think that there's... the re like ans ancestry? Yeah. I, I think that there is an aspect of historicity that creates the, the ego where we are part of a lineage and we know what we are supposed to be because there are people before us that laid that groundwork. Not that down. I-ness. I'm not talking about that I-ness. I'm talking about the I-ness. Sometimes you suddenly wake up and you don't know who you are. You forgot who you are. You don't remember your name. But you still have that I-ness. You see the environment around you. All that is focused on you. That I-ness. I'm not talking of our personal, social or autobiographical iness, which is where our lineage is important. But and and I think that a machine that can have that? Like because that sounds like you're you're basically saying sensory awareness. Just to be able to look around and to realize that there's something outside of yourself, something bigger than yourself. It seems plausible that it Okay, oh so actually hold on a second. I, I think that maybe what you're trying to draw a parallel to would be the structure of the cell inside of the human body versus the human. The cell is a, in miniature a conscious entity that resides within a larger, more complex conscious entity. No, no, no. C cell, cell is conscious. I don't know whether you can say that. I, I won't get into that. I'm not a biologist like you guys are. Um, <laughs> I work on biology as, as an outsider, as an information theorist. Right? Sure. But what I'm talking about is that this I-ness, you know, you have a computer. I'm a computer scientist. I, uh, you know, if you look at neural networks, I've worked on neural networks. I have um, the the first uh, algorithm for instantaneous training of neural networks. You know, you can Google it. And you, uh, I did that some time ago. So you, what a neural network does, and a lot of the new systems that we have in biology or chat GPT and so on are neural networks. There's a huge amount of data, right? And you can abstract patterns out of that data. Now, certainly um, uh, vision machines can do that. They can focus. And our eyes are also machines. Uh, our eyes are instruments. But it's not the eye that sees. It's something in the occipital lobe that sees. What that is, where is that self? We don't know. That self is not in a cell because that would be a problem. That self is in us, but also outside of us in some strange way, because this is where, you know, this is one of those uh, regions of science uh, where we are in the domain of paradox. And to me, uh, um, um, one of the fundamental aspects of self, of one's 
of being oneself, of selfhood uh, as contrasted from machine. A machine is logical, but you and you and I, we hold paradoxes together. Life also means to be at the same time being aware of death. You know, life and death are like twins. Uh, and love is also uh, paired with detachment. You fall in love and you're desperate, you're crazy, you're mad. Then when you meet the person, sometime you fall out of love. So none of this is uh, material in the sense that it can be put in a formal framework. So life is holding together of opposites in some mysterious ways, which is what something that computer can't do. All that a computer does is to store a lot of information, which is, of course, a part of our brain, although we don't know how memory works. It holds a lot of information, and we don't know how we, how we abstract it. We don't know where words come from uh, as we are talking, for example. And, um, and, they, and holding together of these oppositions within ourselves and how cleverly you do it, that's, that's where aesthetics comes in. That's, where, that's art. Art is holding opposites together. Poets know it, you know. Um, um, as you know, I've written many books of poetry, and this is what you learn. That's where the skill of writing poetry comes in. You know, for example, one of the recent poems, uh, you, I start off by saying that uh, to live, you have to die every day. I, I forget the exact word. Life itself is dying. Computers can't do any of that stuff. This, this is subtle stuff. And... Uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, in in uh, in Indian uh, Vedic mythology or Hindu mythology, there's a very interesting image, the image of churning of the ocean. I, I wrote a recent uh, essay on that on Medium, uh, where I have a page, the churning of the ocean. In the churning of the ocean, the demons and the gods come together and churn the ocean so that different gifts would arise. Okay. Uh, the demons are those aspects of ourself who take the body to be everything. And there are those aspects. There are moments, even I, with all that I've done, sometimes I feel that I'm just the body and my body needs this, right? And the, the gods, the devas, are those senses which are connected to infinity, to universality, to, uh, to, to, you know, to the infinite. Now, they have to churn. Which is what where education comes in. Churning, you know, you go, you do your PhD, you're churning. Life is churning. Falling in love is churning, right? Grief is churning. Suffering is churning. Out of that churning comes insight, and the very first insight that comes when on the mythic cosmic plane, the gods and the demons are churning, is this great poison which is going to destroy the whole universe, and then Shiva who is a name for consciousness, primal consciousness, comes and swallows this poison and then holds it in his throat. And that's the poison of the sense of death that every human being must hold before you can hope to do creative work as an artist, as a scientist, as a painter, or even as a constructive politician or as a businessman, anybody. You have to hold life and death together in the same basket. Computers can't do that. Computers can only abstract patterns. They are only instruments. They, they can never do that. In, the, in their current form, I completely agree with you. And I think that you're right, too, that the blending of humans with computers is still just an augmented human. And so you but, have but, to have the biological aspect. In a certain sense, uh, that blending has taken place. We can even fly in an airplane. That's also augmentation in a certain sense, right? We can fly. We can now see across thousands of miles, like you and I are seeing each other. Sure. So this is happening in so many different ways that we are taking for granted. And it will happen, as you say, perhaps in other unforeseen ways or strange or unexpected unexpected is the right word unexpected ways i totally concede that point um could we actually take a i have to use the bathroom really quickly would you would you mind can you hang on for five minutes do you have sure. time okay thank sure. you yeah i want to pick up 
We'll pick up right here. Big news, everyone. We have officially announced ticket sales for Demysticon 2024. This is our first scientific conference, and what we're going to be doing is we are bringing together our favorite podcast guests in Austin, Texas, April 7th and 8th of 2024. And we're going to have a slew of incredible speakers. For right now, we don't have everyone confirmed, but of the ones that we do have confirmed, we have our favorite scientist, Pierre-Marie Robitaille. We have ancient mythology scholar John F. White of the Craig and Ford YouTube channel. We have Ogie Ogas, consciousness researcher. We have Steve Keen, economist. And we have many more that are on deck that we will announce very, very soon. So check out the link in the description. And we hope to see you in Austin, Texas of 2024. All right. So what, what, what you were saying about the ego and the... And, uh, I think what you were talking about with death is really important in defining what's diff- what's imp- what's importantly different between computers and human beings. And I, I want to unpack that a little bit because I've been kind of obsessively reading some of the old Stoic philosophers lately. And I, you know, I've read, medit- I have a copy of Meditations and when I finish it, I just start over. And it seems like one of the things that is really being wrestled with by Marcus Aurelius in this is that how you rectify the fact that you are eventually going to die in some sense, you're already dead because your death is inevitable and everything that's ever lived dies and how that is in fact, part of the the bigger picture. That's perfectly natural and it's a normal flow of things. And I think that when we talk about the ego getting in the way, in some sense, it is still wrestling with death. It's this idea that there's this, finite amount of experience and you have to cram as much into it as much experience and wealth and prosperity and success and achievement. And it seems like that is an interesting feature that computers don't run up against. And and I, I think that it lends credence to the idea that they will never ever develop that ability because it doesn't threaten them the same way. They're, a computer can ostensibly live as long as people keep sticking parts onto it and updating its hardware and software. Uh, Shiloh, uh, I must tell you that uh, Marcus Aurelius is one of my own favorite authors and uh, really enjoyed reading meditations uh, many times. And uh, uh, totally, you're totally uh, you know, spot on. Uh, computers are about, you know, there's no death. It's, uh, it's what's been written on stone, perpetuated and copied any number of times. So there is no, uh, there's nothing which holds things together. You know, what does holding together mean? The center holds this circle together where the opposites are coming together. That's what ego at the center is. And we, each one of us has these opposites. Some are secret in some secret recesses of ourself and some we are not afraid to mention. In fact, um, um, one of the most um, amazing uh, books uh, I ever read, I was young, I was maybe a teenager, and there is this Upanishad called uh, Katha Upanishad or Katha Upanishad. Um, and it's a dialogue um, between um, a young fellow, a young boy named Nachiketa and death. The word in death, the word for death in Sanskrit is Yama. And the other meaning of yama is twin. Yama is the twin to life. And in this, uh, the background of the story is that uh, Nachiketa's father has a big um, sacrifice going on and he's invited everybody. And at the end of the sacrifice, he's giving them gifts. You know, this is the culmination of his life as a famous guy. And this young boy sees that his father is giving only the useless animals to the people who assemble so that he's he's satisfying uh, the requirements of the sacrifice in word, Mm. but not in heart. So he's giving cows which have stopped giving milk and so on and so forth. And uh, this boy gets shocked at the at his father, whom he has adored, could do this. So he asks his father, whom will you give me to while he's in the process? The father ignores him, you know, at his impudence. He says it again, whom will you give me to? He ignores him. When the son says it the third time, the father says, I give you to death. 
So when I read this, you know, the whole setting is so dramatic from a literary perspective. So this young boy says, okay, you know, I'm a good son and now I don't want to prove my father wrong. So I must go to death. And so he seeks out death and he has this conversation, which I recommend to you. In fact, I translated this again recently on my academia page. It's called Kato Upanishad. And uh, there he says, what happens in death? Um, is the, is one finished because the body certainly dies. And that's when Yama or death tells him that, look, uh, consciousness lives on. Mm. So otherwise life is full of grief. If you think your body is going to die, then clearly after you have in school or high school, as it happens very often now, uh, you live through all the sensations that you could live through. Then what is life for? No wonder so many young people, people in the 20s and 30s are dying of fentanyl overdose, you know, beautiful looking people with beautiful children. Why are they doing it? A great sense of despair because we cannot live just by our bodies. Our bodies are going to die. So truly, I think this certainly sets us apart from computers. And I think this is where in some mysterious way when we celebrate life and perhaps what has happened, unlike, say, the United States of 100 years ago, 200 years ago, when you lived on the farms in the country, death was a part of what we saw. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to slaughter an animal for food or or, or whatever else. You saw like death eight of your 10 children died before the age of 15. Or, or death, yeah. right. Or even if the, your own siblings didn't, there were death all around us. So in some sense, we had made peace. Now... There's an antiseptic view. You go to the grocery store, meat is wrapped in foil. You don't know what death is. And I think our divorce from death is the cause for the great despair of modern times. Yeah, it's such an important point. We were hanging out with one of our friends in Santa Cruz who's an evolutionary biologist, or uh, I guess he's an origins of life researcher. And we were talking, the whole conversation was about origins of life. And, and at the end of the conversation, I was like, well, Shouldn't we be talking about the origins of death also? Because there's no way of talking about life without death. And, and it just seems like, you know, if you talk about, uh, I, I think there's fundamentally um, a misconception of what life is. It's a process, right? It's a process that the universe, probably on other planets, there's no reason to believe that on other planets, this process doesn't happen also. That the universe is fine-tuned in the way that the material objects interact such that life emerges all over the place. This, this, uh, this is where I can really get behind this consciousness pervading everything idea is that it seems like it's a necessary effect of all of these motions being in place with the materials that are there, that this will happen and that it passes. And, and it's not like when we, a lot of times people mistake the life for the life form. Like you may be one form, but what you are part of is something much more diffuse and much more necessary in the universe. And so, yes, this, like you said a, a while back, we're really just instances of the same thing. We have very similar experiences fundamentally. We're all experiencing this universe together. That's why we call it a universe. It's the, it's the one, right? And so I can really see a route to that that isn't supernatural or spooky in just that this is what happens in this universe. Life happens, it passes on. Death is part of that because death is necessary for any process. No process continues forever. All processes terminate. And so you're participating in the process of life, but you are not life. And that confusion, I think, rips people apart. And with regard to the, the people and the fentanyl and everything, I, I think that the way that science is taught is... It, it lacks some sense of people being part of this process and instead fixates on the material objects and treats life for, as the life form, which is, of course, finite. And this is does bring a lot of despair because people, like we said earlier, they look towards the scientists for almost guidance in terms of how to be and how to live and what will happen to the future. But that strictly material perspective isn't capable of addressing those issues. It just seems like a real blind spot that we have to iron out in the coming decades. Another point, if uh, we have no trouble 
accepting that gravitation is everywhere. You know, it's gravitation which guides physical bodies. The idea, you know, some people don't like consciousness as transcendent unity as maybe because it's too extravagant. It's sort of unsettling in some sense, or some people might say it's too religious in some sense, the idea of spirit. But why not take consciousness as something akin to gravitation? Mm -hmm. Consciousness is everywhere. It's a potential. You, you said this. Consciousness is a potential which drives all of evolution to certain forms, which can then take it. And if consciousness is a potential, then this potential also existed at the moment of Big Bang. You know, everything existed as a potential at Big Bang. And then things become easier for people to accept. You know, this is, of course, the sociological aspect of what we are talking about. Yeah, and I don't see it as fundamentally incompatible with a material understanding of nature either. Just because some, like, I mean, come on, gravity of these forces, right? They are fundamental in some sense, but that doesn't mean that's the end of the explanation. Just because we haven't been able to probe the subatomic level enough to understand the mechanistic processes doesn't mean they're out there. But in the same sense, I think consciousness is a pervasive force, for sure. That doesn't mean that's the end of the explanation. Like you said, science is this continually generative process of refining our understanding of that. And I think that's a really good place to start is seeing it as a, a deep force that does guide even physical landscapes, right? The earth has been transformed by our conscious decision-making over the even the past 300 years. Uh, God only knows what it'll be like a thousand years from now if we don't, you know, if, if we don't get hit by a meteor or something. Um, so, I, I, go ahead. I, I think, yeah, this idea of how desire and will plays a very important role and in transforming society, and I think the the way uh, the will of experts has been uh, expressed uh, in schools and colleges, where a decision was taken that you shall only speak of certain such things, focus only on life, has in a paradoxical way drawn people to death. You know, if you if you're not if people don't experience death in a natural way when they're growing up, then there is this um, morbid attraction uh, to self-harm, psychological, not necessarily physical self-harm, which is what is drawing people to things such as fentanyl, right? Because they're not, they, they can't believe that they are just this body, which all the experts are telling them that they're just this body. There must be something missing. What is missing is their own self because they've been so alienated from their self, from their consciousness. And I think this is what is leading to unhappiness at so many different levels, not only at one's own personal level, also in relationships, in marriages, in groups of people. So, and I think that is one of those challenges that we confront right now, the world confronts now, because in many ways, what, what happens in America you know, in other societies, certainly in Europe and South America, and certainly even in India, because of America's soft power, people are copying the ideas that come from here. So I think uh, a change in that transformation here is going to have a ripple effect everywhere. I think that's like part of the obsession with Netflix and video games, too, is that they give you that sen that ability to experience death right, that you don't normally experience in the world anymore. And I've often worried about this a lot, too, in, in the way that we sanitize death and bodies are covered up immediately. If there's an accident, they throw a white sheet over it. You know, and they, like, they say it's for respect to the family and stuff, but I think that it's really trying to hide that reality from ourselves, trying to not have to confront it, because it's it would really, if you're intimately aware of your own death at each decision that you make, it's not really compatible with being a great consumer and a great factory worker or a great office worker or something. You might start saying, well, if I might die today, maybe spending the day in this cubicle isn't a great idea after all. Uh, and you see this play out even where people are terrified of talking about their own future. Mm. It's viewed as morbid or weird 
Like This I, isn't polite dinner table conversation or something like that. He, it was really funny, actually, because my brother got married uh, two weeks ago. And the evening before the wedding, we somehow were having, we were sitting around as a family and we were, we got onto the topic of death and what it was going to look like down the line and what we would want from each other when death came. And one of my family members was like, I don't want to talk about this. This is not, this is not good conversation for before a wedding. They got really upset, actually. I mean, not, in the scale of how upset it's possible to get, it was actually quite mild. But it was it was clearly like an emotional moment of, I don't want to talk about this. It's freaky. It's because what my dad was saying is he was saying, because my grandma, she died of Alzheimer's. Or she died with Alzheimer's. I think it's hard to tell. And the last five years or so, it was very, it was it was awful. It was watching someone who was you know, 80 something years old revert to being a newborn, basically. It was, and no one knew what to do because we didn't have a, a way of talking about this. We don't live in a society where we have humane paths towards an end of our own choice. And so when we were sitting at the table, my dad was like, you know, I read about somebody who, uh, when they saw that they were getting Alzheimer's, they basically arranged with their children that they were going to commit suicide. And then their children helped them and they went and it was fine. And it was, for me, I'm like, well, of course I'll help you. <laughs> like, if you decide that that's what you want to do, we'll work it out. But for for my my sibling, it was very, very difficult to even consider that that would one day happen. And I see that a lot in the world. I just see it as a, a real knee-jerk fear that if you actually if you actually integrate at each decision that you make that it might be your last, I mean, you could get, I could be driving to the gym later today and that's it. And I'm planning for 40 more years of life, at least for myself, but that's not totally guaranteed in any way. It's not guaranteed in any way whatsoever. And if you really integrate that, it does alter the decisions that you make. And particularly in, ter in, in a way that might be, I don't want to say ace antisocial, but perhaps anti-industrial or, or anti-progressive in a way that maybe it's not, maybe I shouldn't be spending 80 hours a week grinding at my computer. Maybe I should be spending more time in nature with my family, with my, you know, children. Maybe that's, maybe that actually, it feels more important. So maybe it actually is. And that's, I think that's very, very difficult for people to confront who have who, most, like most of us have chosen to just grind away our lives and work really hard at something. So uh, I, what is really needed is making peace with it. Mm. You know, in a in a way, we are dying all the time. We lose our memories. You know, not every can't remember. And forgetting is part of living. See, if, if you held on to everything, isn't there a very famous case of, I forget his name in Moscow, this guy who could never forget and his life as hell. Uh, one of the great... Uh, uh, cases in psychology. Um, I forget his uh, the initials by which he, he was known. So in a certain sense, we are dying all the time. But if we confront it, if we make peace with it, then we can live life the way it ought to be lived. If we hide it, sanitize it, you know, put it away, that is unnatural. And that is the problem that we face right now. What do you think the key to, to making peace with it is? Because I know that, you know, uh, one thing that's been really fascinating to me is there's been a series of studies where they treat end-of-life patients who are very afraid of, of death. They treat them with these psychedelics and they come out, some, some majority population comes out not having this fear of death anymore. And I wonder if it has to do with integrating their place in this timeless process. I wonder what it is that changes in those people fundamentally, because I don't think it's just like some chemical reaction necessarily. I think they have some insights that allows them to come to peace. What do you, what do you, in your own experience, how do you make peace with death? Well, um, there are two ways of looking at it. One is uh, what you um, sketched out. The other is that you have to live in the moment. What is life? Just imagine on a grand scale, the earth itself is going to die at some point in a few 
billion years, one or two, right? So then what's the meaning of the lives of all of the people who have struggled so hard, who have put, you know, all that they had in whatever careers they had chosen and whatever, you know, relationships they had? Me, or let's look at the current view of reality of the cosmos. Uh, the, the expansion is accelerating. Everything will die. So what's the meaning of it all? I think what one has to do, the only thing that exists is not the past. Past is gone. The future doesn't exist. The only moment that exists is now. So living life fully is to get wedded to the now to live in the moment in a good way. You know, first of all, the moment you realize that we are all the same, that empathy comes into play, that you love comes into play, right? Because we are, we are the same. We, what you are going through, I'm gone through too, or you have gone through as well. So if you live in the moment, that's when the gods will speak to you. <laughs> this is, of course, a more question of faith. <laughs> No, there's some truth then, to that. There's some truth to that, for sure. They and, give you hints. Do this. And life, you know, life is like a dance. Um, uh, if if you have the most beautiful image, a sculpture in your home worth $50 million, after the first day or after I've shown it off to others, you'll never look at it again. Why? Because there is no motion in it. What are fixed, what are lifeless, I shouldn't have used the word lifeless, it's not appropriate here. What is fixed, what is not changing, ultimately doesn't interest us. What interests us is movement, which is why dance is so attractive, right? Or change of, or music can be attractive too. Although, you know, if you hear the same thing again and again, then after some time, it becomes grating. But movement. So what we have to see ourselves as is this movement through the present. And if you are really connected to it, then that vision that you are speaking of, that vision changes. You see things in a new way and new opportunities arise because the gods open doors for you. Now, I'm speaking like a poet, perhaps, not not as a scientist, then doors open up for you and well, wonderful I, things happen. I think poetry might be a better an instrument of the gods. Mm. But, yeah, but, but I think poetry is a perfectly valid way of appraising nature. That's the thing. It's like, it, it, it is the right way to look at things sometimes in a way that mathematical equate. I mean, some people can see mathematics as poetry, but in the way that just a rigorous mechanistic explanation doesn't satisfy you, it, it doesn't guide you in the same way. So I think poetry is a, a super valid way of of looking at life and death. One thing you said that's really interesting is um, it ties back to the, the inception of uh, where do ideas come from. One thing you notice uh, is that, uh, at least in my own experience, but I know in a lot of people who have had idea who speak of their having ideas, is that a they have to kind of clear their mind out, right? So you walk away from the problem. Maybe you go into the woods, you go into the forest, but you notice that they're walking often, right? This moving forward, this movement, coupled to this stillness, actually tunes you to, I think, the larger cosmic landscape, which is also c clear of, you know, uh, being forced in any direction, but also has this movement forward. And, and it allows you to get in sync with that. I, I wonder if there's something deeper to that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, another perspective on it. If you live in the moment, you have to live life as a warrior. Because a warrior on the battlefield lives in the moment. The mm -hmm. warrior can die any moment, right? So you have to be totally focused. And I can give you a personal example. Uh, early 90s, I was giving a lecture on neural networks. And somebody, a student, um, asked me a question. I had never thought of it. And it was a question of honor. You know, here you have to respond to something that you have never thought about. And in that moment, when you are suspended between life and death, I said something which came out, I don't know from where, which became a very important paper. So it came that intuition worked at that moment. So this whole thing about between life and death, right? That is because life itself has to be coupled with death. So that because it's movement, otherwise it's dead, right? So 
to learn how to do that is going to be a big challenge for society because that's not being done uh, everything is being made much more antiseptic you know airbrushed and kids don't know what everything is about and that's why as i mentioned earlier you know you have so much of problems that teenagers have uh, or even motivation why should they do something um, and uh, and and so at a societal level one can see uh, the importance of all of these insights and certainly at a personal level you have this churning you have to do between both the aspects of yourself of oneself and it's only through that churning through that constant questioning and that questioning is a process of ceaseless change ceaseless movement that gifts shall be given to you without asking you shall not get answers mm. and that questioning is that process where you are entreating you know we're not talking in terms of old fashioned religious devotion we are talking of a process uh, of confronting reality for what it is uh, and not just looking at symbols you know of whatever cultural background one may have and once one does that that's when something happens and that's when a rebirth takes place and in that moment then you're not who you were before mm. you're a new person mm. and and sometimes what happens in families because marriage uh, came up some time ago sometimes the two spouses they're not evolving at the same stage and then there can be tremendous unhappiness in one who's unhappy that the other has stopped because you want if you are in this dance you want the other also to be on this dance because you know it's a beauty thing of beauty a dance with two or even more is a thing of beauty so that's where a lot of stress comes in um, and and so you know once one realizes that the answers are within you because this thing which is more than yourself and your memories and your body and your personal experiences which also helps us connect to people who are long dead like marcus aurelius why do you or i see almost total uh, what congruence total, yeah total congruence how is it possible that guy led uh, 15 1600 years ago where does that come from so that's more than my personal life experience and it's that uh transcending thing that uh, science should ultimately address itself to and that's where it may have lost its way although i'm sure the best amongst the scientists also because i've seen some popular science stories on how they want to go beyond neo darwinian synthesis right ask questions about uh, desire and will and certainly uh, uh, in my case the question of information at least to the extent it has solved the problems i'm not saying that the whole community of scientists is clapping its hand saying oh subhash kak you've done it no you know i put it out there and let's see where it goes but at least it is a framework and what is the ultimate sense of this framework it brings the self it brings consciousness center stage that science is not only about bodies and objects it's about something else as well it is about bodies and objects ultimately good science should be based on bodies and objects right and mathematics and connections but there is the other side mm-hmm. to it and uh, which is the ancients understood yeah. this a lot better and oftentimes it gets passed off as superstition right we talked about the gods and so forth and a lot of people hear the word god and they're just like ah not science right but when the ancients were speaking of gods i think they were really talking about these that congruence right the fact that these same instincts and patterns the rage and the love and the uh equanimity and the magnanimity like these principles that we aspire to have been the same throughout the ages and we each experience them and it's almost when you're possessed by these like it is a god taking hold of you and i think that the ancient I hate to call them religions but the pantheons the gods they get a bad rap as being some superstitious idiocy when in reality those people were much more tuned in to these shared 
let's say, programs that are running inside of us at all times. And, and science turns away from those these days, which I think is an interesting blind spot that we're, that we're dancing around here. Well, science turns so, so, away from uh, sorry, it. Sorry, yeah. yeah. I, I think that it's important to note that science turns away from it because it believes that technology will make us transcend what we once have been. And there is a transhumanist element that runs through all of this, which is that we will escape death, we will escape gender, we will escape the biology of what it means to be human, and we will become something else. And that is the front line of what it, people refer to as the culture war. Because it is the people who look and say that, no, there is something biological and there is something spiritual, and the others that point to it and say, that is something that we can erase. But the failure to erase that is, I think, what leads to something like the fentanyl crisis. It also is what leads to communism. You know, my, my parents come from Soviet Russia, and it was characterized by this fervent desire to erase human nature, where we can transcend and... Our politics are such that we can push beyond the biological limits and become something wholly new that, that evolution has never seen before. And it just, it fails. It always fails when people try because we don't understand what makes us who we are well enough to be able to manipulate it. And it's not physical enough for us to be able to manipulate it. And you see this all the time where people say one thing, but they want another. And so even if you were to understand the physical, and try to manipulate it, I think that you still wouldn't be able to reach the spiritual because it's something that is disconnected from, from action. And it's so fundamental. It's like, could we disconnect ourselves from chemistry? No. But, and and no, no sooner can we disconnect consciousness from being alive and from the universe itself. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's built in, it's baked into the cake, so to speak. But I think that science isn't a good tool for doing this because science is by nature reductionist and materialistic and oh go ahead but the best scientists will be in agreement with us the yes. greatest scientists even now uh, will totally agree with us uh, we're not talking only of historical figures like you know schrodinger or heisenberg uh, but there are scientists in every field who want to push the frontiers and who are aware that what allows them to push the frontiers is their own self, selfhood in some sense. So it comes from them, which in sense also means that it's already hard baked into our biology, right? It's not my ego or their ego. Ultimately, they are instruments of this biology. Now we are not using any religious terms, right? Mm. So, uh, so it's our biology, it's our nature, which is making us go in this direction while we are immersed in a certain cultural milieu. You know, right now there's a certain cultural milieu, Soviet Union, there was one, but they were, even in the Soviet Union, they were um, the best thinkers who were aware that this was a kind of a dictatorship where people were not being allowed to think uh, clearly, novelists and scientists. There's so many wonderful people, great people, and they kept on at it. And of course, they had to mask. They didn't, they were not always, it wasn't easy for them to say things the way they would have otherwise liked to say. And it's the same thing that has happened now because the current wokeism is really Marxism, cultural Marxism. And so a kind of a shadow has fallen, sadly on the West itself. But that shadow in some sense is also necessary because in order for science to move ahead, there's got to be a crisis. Mm. For, just as for an individual to move ahead, there's got to be a crisis. You know, when doors get shut, some other doors open. So we should welcome this. This, what has happened right now, the crisis, although individuals go through suffering, which, you know, is terrible, but collectively, this crisis was probably essential because otherwise we won't have known how to use computers. We must push it in all directions and gaming and so on. As you said, people find that uh, connection with what they have been deprived of in their real life through gaming. Uh, and, and, and people will at some point see the limits to all of that and then turn to the real thing, to nature. Because ultimately, it's nature that heals. It's the, it's nature 
that points the way forward. Yeah, I love that. Uh, one thing you mentioned too that's that I just can't let pass by is interesting how you you snuck you said biology as the actor. You kind of substitute, and I see this happen when I talk to evolutionary biologists and origins of life researchers. They actually say evolution did this or biology did this and it's really not that different than saying god did this or god did that right you're still reifying some pattern of natural motion let's say or national natural reactivity into an actor and it's it's interesting how in some sense we've turned away from the spiritual sense but we've just given it a new name and sanitized it and made it something scientific but in actuality we're still talking about a motive force that's beyond our understanding. But we've eradicated the will from it, which is the weirdest thing, because biologists, when you start talking to them about will and desire and motivation, don't want to talk about that. Yeah, and that, that's the reason for the crisis. And so they are at a certain stage, and now uh, things will change. Because the only way they can confront the current crisis, like there was a crisis in the 1920s in physics, that why don't the electrons which are negatively charged fall into the nucleus, which is positively charged? And that brought in the mind uh, through the back door, because quantum mechanics is just a theory of description of reality. Mm -hmm. There's, it, there's no, nothing beyond it. It only says such and such things happen because of such and such a way um, mm -hmm. at the micro level all kinds of mutually exclusive properties coexist. But when you see it, you can only access something. You know, that is so just a statement of, of the way nature works. It, it, it doesn't explain why quantum mechanics is what it is, right? So likewise, now there's a problem in, uh, in biology. And so what is required is a, a, a good writer, uh, expressing this whole framework and synthesizing it. And that will then have a uh, impact in some time. Like, I, I don't like a lot of what Richard Dawkins does, but his book, The Selfish Gene, was influential in its own way, right? Because it changed the focus from the macro to the micro, to the nucleus, so to speak. So I think what is needed, the time has come for uh, for a person to come forward and present a new new synthesis and talk about desire and will. And I think they are absolutely important. And that will be bringing in the mind or consciousness again, because I'm absolutely convinced uh, based on my uh, recent research last several years that science will come forward as we will, you know, we've sort of turned away from the consciousness aspect of reality. There is physical reality, which we must embrace completely, but we put it too much of a focus on it and we should redress the balance. It should be balanced. There should be this and there should be that. And the next revolution in science will occur when we do this. And there will be many opportunities in biology, in cosmology, maybe in genetics, as uh, I've tried to do recently or in, uh, in cosmology. And in other fields as well, in neuroscience as well. So, so uh, to sort of tie it all together, um, totally agree with what you said in the beginning. You know, this is what science should be. Demystifying science means accepting this constant movement in the conversation about science, because the conversation is in terms of language. Consciousness doesn't lend itself to be described because consciousness is the experiencing subject. It's the light. Consciousness is the light and what we see is the objects that we have around us. So we must carry, carry out this dance between the two, both in the field of the canvas of science, you know, the big picture, but also importantly within ourselves mm. because that picture has an analogous Stage, so to speak, within our own hearts. And doing that not only allows us to do better science, to be creative, to see things more truly, if you will, but also to find that equipoise within ourselves, to find that, that place of balance between life and death, between the, the, the equipoise 
stationarity in change, if you will. Of course, that's not possible. But that is what we are looking for. That's beautiful. I think that's a that's a good place to to put a pin in this for now. I feel like we could talk to you for hours and hours more, but uh, maybe we should just get together again down down the road. Um, I yeah, I think that thing. I mean, it's like the old cliche: it's always darkest right before the dawn. I do think that things have to get kind of broken in order for people to really be motivated to fix them. But there's also a balance where you need a society that's free enough that people have the time and energy to be able to think about these problems like on podcasts like this or people listening to this podcast can actually have the space to think about what a better future can actually look like and move towards it. And so it's kind of a really amazing moment in history because, yeah, there's a lot of trouble. Like you you mentioned, there's a lot of social tension and polarization. But I think that you're right that that's necessary in order for, I think things do have to come to a crisis in order for us to move through them. So... I, I, I'm very optimistic myself, and uh, the humans have incredible potential, and science has incredible potential to to be unified and to bring the humanity back into our understanding of nature, which I think is ultimately necessary in order for us to succeed as a species. And as long as we can think clearly about the questions at hand without being driven by these cultural emergences of what is allowed to be spoken of and what isn't allowed to be spoken of and what pieces do we fold into it versus what pieces we leave behind. Thank you, Anastasia and uh, Shiloh. And isn't it amazing that we uh, set out to talk about astronomy? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> next time, next time, <laughs> next time. Uh, but, but it's wonderful, you know, um, Thank you very much for um, uh, getting me on your show. Really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, I will um, share it with my um, followers on social media. I, I have quite a bunch. So hopefully uh, it'll travel far. Beautiful. Thank awesome. you so much. Yeah. I really hope we can meet up again. It's been really fun to talk to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. And the very best to you. All right. Take you care, well. Subhash. Right. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye, everybody.